Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening if you're further along in the time zone further east. Good morning if you're further along west. And uh, thank you for joining us today as part of the SIG HCI annual workshop on HCI research in MIS. I have the pleasure of kicking off the keynote presentations, uh, beginning with our industry keynote. Next to me, Dr. Elizabeth Churchill, ACM Fellow, past president of the ACM, and current senior director of user experience at Google. Uh, we're delighted to lure her away from her usual networks and bring her into the AIS community, and as well so we can benefit from her expertise, from her wisdom, and the insight that she will be sharing with us, along with a little bit of a history of the ACM uh, SIG Pi community, uh, which will be of interest to most of us who may not have had a chance to interact with our peers, our fellow researchers engaged in HCI work through a somewhat different uh, disciplinary perspective. So with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. And uh, for the people online, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat and uh, Mark will moderate the questions at the end of Elizabeth's presentation. With that, please join me welcoming Elizabeth Churchill to us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Constantinos. That was a lovely introduction. And uh, thanks, everybody, for having me here. I really, really appreciate it. And wow, what an amazing series of talks. There's so much great work going on. So I really appreciate uh, hearing about all of the work that uh, you've been doing. Um, so uh, my title is a bit long. I'm British. Sometimes my sentences are quite long. Um, from Usability to Socio-Technical System Ecologies. And I have one question to ask. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Boom. So yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, way back when, a few years ago, I was vice president of SIG CHI, the special interest group for computer human interaction for ACM. Went on to be more involved in senior levels at ACM, but also always kept my heart in uh, SIG CHI and uh, HCI. So um, what was the history of SIG CHI? Well, this is a photo of 1983 in Boston, which was the first CHI conference. And CHI, computer human interaction, human factors and in computer interaction, um, is the flagship conference with attendees between, varies between sort of 3,000 and 5,000 um, at the conference. And hundreds and hundreds of papers and something like 21 parallel tracks. You, you, know, you know the deal. But what's interesting about this particular conference is that the year before, there had been this sort of group gathering in Gaithersburg, and a call went out for the conference to say, who would like to come and think about human-computer interaction? And the story goes, I wasn't around at the time, but the story goes that they had anticipated maybe, I don't know, 100 people or something, and something like you know, 700 people showed interest, and <laughs> quite a lot of others showed up. Now, why? A lot of people were starting to see this influx of technology into our everyday lives, into the workplace, um, into the home. And people were starting to really understand that we, we need to know how to use these tools better because they're actually quite hard to use. But it was an amazing group of people who came together from multiple different areas and different contexts to really think about what is this thing about human and computer interaction? How do we interact with these smart devices, these computational devices that are going to aid us in our productivity in the workplace, as well as potentially in our personal lives? Now, we all know that that has really grown and grown and grown, but they had an inkling about that. And what was happening at that time, 1983? Well, I love looking at the computer history timelines of what was going on at the time. You know, I think in another life I would have been a historian. But, uh, you know, here we have the computer of the time. Um, this is, you know, Microsoft Word was sort of starting to come about. Uh, CDs. I remember when CDs were like the big thing. Woo! Um, I still have a lot of vinyl, so just letting you know. Um, you know, synthesizers. Uh, like amazing stuff was coming out. And so this proliferation of things that were digital and potentially, if not actually computational, was really starting to go out into the world. But this is the kind of environs, if you want, 
that these scholars and researchers were sort of living in at the time. And, you know, a lot of the video data terminals that were around looked like this. And I wanted to show you this because the association of human-computer interaction as a single person sitting, staring at this screen, you know, is a particular vision of human-computer interaction. Um, and this, of course, is not networked. You're sort of sitting in your own world. It's a bounded box, right? So it's complex, but it's bounded. And the tasks that you can achieve with it are specific. And you get trained to do them. Very different from our world of discretionary technologies that we carry around. So, of course, this is the kind of model that came up, right? So perception, reasoning, we've been talking about that a lot today. Um, communication, motor skills. These are the kinds of things. You're tethered. You're not wandering around. I was wandering around with my laptop earlier. I mean, who would have believed that then, right? And this is Card Moran and Newell's 1983 model human processor. Um, and my PhD was actually sort of a derivative of trying to understand the goals and operators and methods, um, GOMS model, uh, that came from this. I still love GOMS. I will have no words against GOMS. Um, but, you know, this kind of trying to think about how humans reason and the time frames that we have for solving problems, as well as things like, you know, Don Norman came later and started to talk about feedback and how you understand what is the gulf between your understanding and the action. Um, and I'm just turning that on. But I want to just take us, this is my own idiosyncratic history of HCI. Because, of course, that single person sitting, da, 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 doing the sort of psychology of reasoning, that's only one little bubble version of that person. The person is sitting in an environment of production. They are in an organizational context. So, of course, once we start to go for, away from the screen, we start to know that there are motivations and incentives that are in the organizational context. And a lot of the work that goes back to the 1910s and the 1920s around organizational psychology is very much about motivating people, very much about engaging people to do the work, trying to understand how you change the organization of work for the culture of production, for whatever it is. So I think a lot of the workplace studies that go all the way back then are still relevant to HCI and to us, actually, as a combined community. Um, human factors. You know, World War II, in particular, saw a massive, massive investment in improving what we call interaction design and the ergonomics of information, the cognitive ergonomics of information, but also the physical ergonomics because, you know, that mind body space. But again, I want to show you so human computer interaction is actually about that peripheral awareness of collaboration and cooperation through the system as you are embodied in the ledger that you put in and somebody else picked up at the other side those inscribed objects, those things that are boundary objects that go between one context and another, but you're also physically co-present with that person. So you've got that distributed, hey, how do you do that? I can't remember how to do it. Oh, you just press escape. Oh, okay. How much quicker is that than through documentation? <laughs> um, and I would argue that uh, through the pandemic and working from home and being isolated, we have seen some of the ways in which that embodied cooperative <laughs> collaboration has been kind of changed. And I love to talk about, you know, how do you feel about yourself having stared at yourself all day? Because actually, I think there is a sort of a, a relationship with ourselves as objects and a relationship with ourselves as embodied cooperative collaborators that has shifted. And I don't know about you, but I'm finding it a bit hard to come out of. And I'm pretty social. <laughs> so, you know, we're still working on that. Um, so here we come to human-computer interaction. And I focus on human cognition and interaction with computers for sure. 
But look at all of the different disciplines, and this is just some of them. I, I got this from online. And to other disciplines. And user experience, which is my job title, um, has really taken off. And I think that's very interesting because user experience, UX, has become a dominant sort of paradigm within industry. And you know, UX, even within my company, started off as usability engineering, very focused on the interface and interaction, doing amazingly great work. And now we have more than 5,000 UX people who are doing everything from hardware interaction to you know, ethnographic analyses of people's engagement with things like Google Maps. I mean, the, the range of disciplines that are coming together to speak to what is the experience of these devices is uh, amazing. And my company is just one example. Many companies are seeing the value of this multidisciplinarity. So um, that's a sort of like whole uh, overview. And this is, the, I think, actually a really nice definition. I use this one all the time. And it's from 1994. But often we forget about that richness around the whole kind of human-computer interaction is a discipline concerned with the design, the implementation and evaluation of interacting, interactive computing systems for human use and with the study of major phenomena surrounding them. It's a beautiful, expansive definition. And I hope that people can all see themselves in that definition. Even if you don't do all of it, cooperatively and collectively, we cover it if we keep talking to each other. And I think what's interesting also here is the for human use is very important. But we're moving into a time, and one of my first provocations is how are we designing those agents that are intelligent, that are not necessarily human? And how are they designing us? And how do we co-design each other? And a great example of that is somebody talked earlier about bias. And you know, our biases are getting inscribed into the systems that we build and are being amplified. Those systems are reflecting human bias. Now, how do we socialize each other? And how do we learn how to socialize those systems, those socio-technical systems? And that is going to be a critical question. And it touches on ethics, and it's beyond and more than ethics. It's actually an imperative for thinking about how we cohabit together with those agents and with each other. And I think for especially information systems, the management of those, this is going to be a critical area that we work in together. And this, I took this from Error Ergonomics and Medical Informatics as a domain. I think it was James Reason who originally came up with this. But it's been generally talked about as the blunt end and sharp end. Um, and this is uh, about thinking about, uh, a lot of work has been done with nurses in the, in the health situation. And the action that you take right at the moment you decide to prescribe something or apply a drug sits within a whole pyramid of the work that you do. Again, the culture of production. What are your workflows and your journeys every day? What are the tools and technologies that you use? What are the infrastructures that you use? And again, I'm going to come back to that idealized model of the tool that makes you productive, when we all know that this is a bricolage of many, many, many different tools. How many of you have gone from one tool, you're like, all right, I'm filling out my expense report. Oh, gosh, I've got to go over to this other place to get that piece of information, to complete that piece of information, to come, oh, oh, I got timed out, I've got to log in again. Um, I was talking to the IT department of the Air Force, um, and they have this in spades. And I think you all have this in spades, I know I do. But those workflows and journeys, 
And how do we change the infrastructures that support them and get, get the information management between those computational systems to talk to each other in a way? And then, of course, we've got requirements, regulations, and policies, which we all sit within. And those themselves are technologies. They're technologies of cultural production. Now, why I love this pyramid is that that action might take one minute, might take a split second. But the journeys take a lot of time and thought to plan out, to think about, to optimize. I'm a big fan of that book, The Checklist Manifesto, which takes a lot of complexity and creates a checklist in a very complex environment and provides a scaffold for people to talk to each other. The infrastructure takes even longer. Who here has tried to swap out, for example, an HR tool? I'm finding it hard to just, you know, update my computer. This is, <laughs> it's just amazing. And the requirements and regulations and policies take a very long time, and they're slow. And one of my big mantras to everybody all the time is, please get involved even though it's slow. You might be every day involved in the action piece, but have a voice at the regulation piece, please. Because that is where we can have a voice that has, we scale, we scale ourselves. So I'm now just going to talk about some of the conferences I go to routinely. Um, and these are ACM conferences. And so if we're thinking about technology, hardware, devices, and interfaces, um, the WIST conference is a great one to go to. Because there you see some of the techniques that are at that action end that really are the ones that are going to transform a tiny thing you might see that's very technically complex, but it's just changes, for example you know, the latency on how you interact with one of your devices. That scales and changes, but it's a great conference to go to. Um, interaction and service design, there's a lot of user experience conferences. There isn't an ACM one specifically, but user experience shows up. And user experience, as I say, tends to be um, more the practitioner in industry approach. But again, with guidelines that come from amazing work, like the work that you're all doing, like the checklist manifesto, you can scale <laughs> what you're doing. Um, the, oop, the physical environment, there's ubiquitous computing and tangible computing is a great conference, which starts to look at you know, mobility. Mobile HCI is another great one. Starting to understand how we take technology out into the physical world. Um, the great work on um, museums and so forth. A lot of folks from the sort of tangible and ubiquitous computing world have built great museum exhibits and educational exhibits, and they show up um, there. And CSCW, Computer Supported Corporate Work and Social Media, was just mentioned. And really, the people and practices and the societal and policy, policy issues do show up at that conference. And interestingly, somebody just asked me recently, you know, what, what's a paper that you remember that you, know, you always think about. And this paper was from 1994, I think. It was by John Bowers and others. And it was called something like the work to make the network work. And it was a beautiful piece of ethnographic work over a couple of years, which was looking at the procurement and installation of a large uh, information system. And all of the different stakeholders and all of the different conversations and what work they had to do in order to make the network work. And when they said work, it's not just, can I connect? Does it plug in? But does it work for the productivity goals, ultimately? And I don't know, it's like 1994, I think it was, but I read that fairly regularly because like that slow change thing, I'm like, they touched on so many things that were the slow change. And the recommendations that were made about the specific technology absolutely solid, but there was other recommendations about that resilience and continual <laughs> revisiting, um, I think, are, you know, something that really resonates for me. How many people in this room have like, I've said that, I've said it before, and I'm saying it again? But that's our job, right? 
Um, so anyway, that's where I see HCI. And having been here for a day, and again, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you for having me. I see so many resonances, so many connections. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm, while I'm thinking of the connections and I'm thinking about all of those things, these benign devices in our homes, beautiful design, physical. If you think of all of those conferences and beyond, this device is the, and its, you know, cousins, are embodiments of what looks like a simple interaction that is incredibly complex. What looks like a simple piece of hardware, incredibly complex. What looks like, you know, simple in the home physical environment, I don't know, I had to move my house around to accommodate mine. Um, what looks like um, a service, or a product, I should say, is actually a set of intertwined services, each with its own needs. And the seams between them, a bit like uh, Conway's law, sometimes show up. Conway's law being, you know, whatever you build will reflect your organizational structure because the nature of the collaboration means that there are seams between the different bits that you hand off. So very complex. And then we go up to these. These are two areas that I've been like looking at recently. Um, human building interaction. In increasingly, our buildings are getting smart. What does it mean to interact with a building? What if my building is smart? Back to that, how do we co-train each other? And if I'm in a building with a lot of other people, what collective co-training occurs? Um, and and if, it, if it's in the home versus public and collaborative spaces, we were just hearing about museums, you know, AI in public and collaborative spaces. What are those, if, if my little de talking device is multiple services layered upon each other that are all negotiating with seams, how much more complex is this going to be? And is it becoming now? Uh, platform urbanism is another thing I've been getting very interested in, which is the way in which our social and other infrastructures are changing the way we move through time and place. And the way in which the information that is gathered manages us as much as, much as we manage that information, if we can. And what management do we want to have of that information? I'm not going to get into data and ethics, but you know I'm, I'm, I'm abutting that. Um, but very, very interesting area. There's some fantastic papers that have shown how um, wonderful services like Instagram, which I personally love, are changing the very physical environments we're in. Because, you know, if you have a shop and you can afford to be Instagrammable, suddenly that neighborhood becomes a place which is desirable. So very interesting ways in which these information systems are changing. And we are changing those information systems as well as our physical spaces. Um, so I'm going to come to a close now because I hope we have lots of discussion. And information systems were embedded within and interacting with and co-shaping. And the extent to which we co-shape is sort of our choice at some level, collectively. And how we interact with and manage these systems and our social systems is the collaborative research agenda of the future and of now is my view. We're entangled um, and we're intertwined and, and I think we do have agency. Um, and, and we have agency in all kinds of different ways. And one of the conversations I like to have between our communities is what are those different ways of thinking about agency and thinking about co-design and thinking about how information is designed and we're designing it and it is designing us. And so I just put up some words here that I heard today. I heard a lot more. And I was like, perception, trust, emotion, HCI in 1983. And empathy is on the agenda. And I love the talk about, you know, how can agents be empathic and express empathy? So that's the performance, the performative, and how do we act and interact. 
collaboration, bias, the bots and bias. I really love that idea and the incentives that we have, organizations have, but also the, the tools have. Cognition, cognitive di dissonance, cognitive load, multimodality, yes, decision making. These are just a few words, but honestly, I was sitting at the back there. Probably, I, I think thought, people thought I was a, a student volunteer, but I didn't have the right t shirt. <laughs> but I was actually um, listening, amazing talks. These are just some of the words that came out, and I was like, the overlap of interests is just amazing, and the human is at the center. The human is at the center. Oh, that's just a old one. And I'm going to stop now and uh, have questions, if that's okay. Does that work with the online as well? Will people be asking questions online? Yes, we can in the chat. But we'll turn first to people in the room, and I'll grab the microphone and run it back. And these were just sort of general provocations. So this is a conversation. Desi and I were talking earlier, and this is a, meant to be a conversation. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for this interesting talk. And uh, I'm talking from uh, from uh, from the Sim from Copenhagen Business School. So I'm just, uh, I have two very kind of high level questions, but you allow us to go from very nitty gritty creatures of interaction all the way to society. So I will stay in the society level. And uh, one question is, uh, uh, given that we are now having a next keynote speak, speech, I think it's about what is special about this HR community. I was very interested in hearing your view of maybe it's unfair question, but what are your expectations to this HR community? Different from the ACM uh, HR community, would you expect something different to come up, different kind of research to come up? Uh, that would be one question. I have another one, which is even a uh, more high level, given that uh, we also have in this conference Michael Vesta, who is English, by the way, the EU Commission, who find your company uh, and you recently lost uh, in European court. Do you think that differences in the way your company are working with? Uh, HR issues in different regions of the world? That's the second question. Um, I'll go for the second one first, which is I honestly know nothing about that, other than what you read in the papers. Um, I can answer the second part of that, which is does um, HCI or UX address issues differently across the world? Yes. Um, so like I said, we have a lot of uh, great ethnographic research. We have a lot of embedded research. We're a global UX um, group. And uh, people do address the issues, um, especially the interaction issues and the experience well, no, issues, and see what differences there are. And see how um, activities in different parts of the world show up differently. For example, things like you know, payments. How does payments sort of you know, show up in different parts of the world? But certainly in my world, that higher level issues around the company corporate engagements, it's I don't have any insights into that at all. Um, uh, but um, you know, in, in terms of this community and the HCI community, I'm not very embedded in this community, but where I see differences is um, I see a very deep engagement with um, the, the business needs and the business value systems and the uh, ways in which the, the technological fits within the business arena. So that's one thing. Um, another thing I see is, I think there's a, there's a bunch of methodologies and approaches that because they come from more of that kind of social and business side, they're slightly different from what I see at CHI. Now that's not to see, say, when I look at some of the CSCW work and some of the work showing at CHI, I'm seeing some of those cross-fertilizations. And um, I'm really liking that because I think there's a way of seeing the individual interacting with a technology, and maybe some sort of uh, socio-cultural or you know, political, the small p, ways in which um, technologies show up. But I think there's a lot more um, idea of what are the structures of that that seem to exist within this community. Um, so if I were to also go to the sociology world, I'd say that they would bring a slightly different lens. So the unit of analysis might be slightly different, and the particular
approach and method might be slightly different, and the audience might be different. And I think where, where, where we can come together is say, hey, you know, we have a real expertise in that audience, and we understand how that audience sees this kind of work. I was talking to someone earlier about one of the things I like to do when I work with teams and take over teams, build teams, is to really in, imbue this idea that the value systems of this social and technical human you know, perspective is everybody's business. And that includes trying to talk to folks from other disciplines um, who are not trained you know, in the kinds of things that we care about and actually bring the discipline and bring the ideas to them. So I work mostly with um, amazing engineers who don't have a training in what we care about. But you know, after you've worked with them for a little while and you show what you can bring, you, you start to learn the language of engineering and they start to learn the language of UX and HCI. And I think what this community has is the language of management and information, the language of business. And so, um, you know, this is a very quick impression, but that's the impression that I get and that I'm really appreciating. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Elizabeth? Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for that wonderful talk. My name is Suranga from NES. Uh, we look at uh, in my lab, augmented human lab, how to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was so I stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I did. <laughs> so, we, at my augmented human lab, we look at the ways to humanize technology, which means how do we lower the barrier to use technology and, and create interfaces that increase the, the perceptual and cognitive capabilities. But one of the things that we struggle or we constantly think, which I uh, would love to hear your thoughts, is when you create these interfaces, they increase productivity, maybe our uh, cognitive ability. The, the question is, how do we deal with the fairness? Who sh should decide who gets what? You know, do we want to create superhumans or do we want to focus on the other side where we focus on people with specific needs? And how do we strike the balance? And what are your thoughts when you design new products and services? Do we focus more on increasing the productivity, ability of somebody who's already can do stuff, or you focus more on people on the other side of the, the spectrum where they need things to, to compensate for their current abilities? Um, it, it's going to sound like a hedge, but it's not, but both. Um, so I'll give you my specific context. Um, I work in a context with hundreds of engineers. And they're, you know, when people say the developer or the engineer, it sounds like they're all the same, and they're absolutely not. They're all very deep experts with slightly different ways of working, slightly different expertise. And so my team's job, my job, is to have the whole unit be productive, um, the whole team. And so that might be focusing on particular individuals, that might be focusing on particular individual skill sets, um, and to really try and understand how we can, as a team, be more productive. Because that's another thing about productivity. It gets measured often as an individual level, but it's really about the, 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 ultimately the team. So that's one thing. The second thing is that I'm a very strong believer in um, uh, you know, universal access and uh, cognitive diversity and neurodiversity. And my team in particular, um, we do um, quite a bit of work on trying to get uh, through a product inclusion uh, program of work, which I'm one of the co-sponsors on, to get everybody again sensitized to this idea that we're not all exactly the same. Um, now, the next part of that is trying to understand. I really believe that if you have very diverse teams, you get better products. Because I was actually, I was actually showing somebody um, a deck that I'd come up with, which I thought was completely understandable to everybody. Mm -hmm. And I went to somebody outside my team, and I was like, "But it's obvious." And <laughs> she, she, she looked at me, and she's like. Okay, slide number three, I have no idea what you're talking about. Slide number five assumes five different things that I have no idea what you're talking about. And so we all get into ourselves too much. It's just human. 
you know, it's not criticism, and self-compassion, you know. But I think if you have diverse teams who are there to ask questions from different perspectives, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so the last part of what I'm going to say is it's not just designing the technology and designing the communication and designing the collaboration culture. It's also designing the onboarding process of bringing people in who you know have potential capability but may not have had as much exposure to all of the training. And so there is this sort of sensibility of like passion, curiosity, ability to kind of focus, will take you a lot further than specific procedural or technical skills which can be taught. And so my team in particular is very, very engaged with content strategy that's accessible, with training and inclusion and workshops. And I was just at a boot camp last week. I was at a boot camp about firing up an operating system that we're working on. I, I just failed to get my system, my computer to work. And I think that's fine. That's fine because it, it's important for everybody to be able to show their vulnerability around certain areas. And so we try to create a culture where people can express what's working and what's not. And I, and I like to try and model that, which is easy for me because, you know, working on an operating system is very complex. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. And Elizabeth, uh, Mark used me for the last question, so I'll read the question that came from the chat from uh, Vizke Van Osh, Associate Professor at HEC Montreal, a Professor of Digital Transformation. Uh, Vizke asks, being yourself being at the unique intersection of academia and industry, what are the key differences you see between the main challenges for HCI for the future in practice versus in research? The main challenges for HCI. Are they aligned or do we, in our ivory tower, have a wrong perception of the, what the challenges may be, what the priorities in the research area for HCI may be? Well, I don't know if you've got the wrong priorities because that's another one of the conversations that I would like us to have. Um, I don't... I have seldom, I wouldn't say I've never, but I've seldom met a researcher, an academic, uh, who believes they're in an ivory tower. Um, and now that's a projection upon, um, not, not to say I haven't, but um, most of the researchers I've come across are passionate about what they do and actually want other people to know what they do. They want people to know. Well, I've been working on this for years. Can you please show an interest? Thank you. Um, and I think the other thing that is very important about that question, one of the things I've been talking about within the ACM community, and I actually just pulled a panel together for CSCW um, last month, uh, is on translational science, this notion of translational science. This notion that there is pure research, whatever you want to call that, and pe some people have to do that work and want to do that work, and that is their, their desire, that's the way they think. And then there are other people who are translators. I'm a translator. I like to translate the imperatives of business, and I like to translate the fantasticness of work. And I love to find examples of where there's an application for something. And then you have people who are real solid on the edge between, you know, the swim lane is translation to uh, practice, full practice. And those are your absolute friends because they're the ones who will say, hey, that's a really cool idea. I think we can take that into product. And I sort of sit somewhere in the middle. And, and I think these are skills that we can learn. That, back to the conversation around, you know, what is the language? How, what are the, the, we have different languages. How do we teach each other the language? You know, I, I, I can't expect all of the engineers on my team to really care about cognitive load. But if I tell them, you know, if we make that a little easier, you might not be scratching your head for long, as long. You're like, oh, that would be great. You know, we can create a dashboard for you which actually shows how all of the devices in the field are actually performing at any time and if there's actually, you know, a memory loss on one of them. You don't have to go and calculate that. They go, oh, that's fantastic. Now, I talk about it as cognitive load and reduction of cognitive load and information representation for decision making. And they're just like, oh, that's better. <laughs> I can get my job done. <laughs> Except they're Americans, so they don't have that accent. <laughs> <laughs>
And on that note, <laughs> thank you so much for being here with us, uh, for sharing your presentation of the overview of the history of the Kai community and uh, the uh, takeaways from today's workshop session with a nice extension of how our, we're uniquely positioned, along with the final notes about the language, the importance of identifying who's our, defining who's our audience, using the right language, and uh, charting our own journey, but at the same time, building bridges between communities. So uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being here with us. Thank you.